Don Hahn. The uh, Golden Gate Bridge opened in San Francisco. Yes, Golden Gate Bridge fans out there. The, um, the Lincoln Head on Mount Rushmore was dedicated in 1937. Um, the Hindenburg disaster happened in 1937, unfortunately. Big cheer for the Hindenburg. Um, this guy on the wheelchair was our president, Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah, good guy. Um, and Amelia Earhart went on an airplane ride and never came back in 1937. So it was a really interesting year, you know, and the, um, the top actor of that year was this guy, who is Clark Gable, thank you, very good. And the top actress of 1937 was Shirley Temple. Can you believe that? She was by far the top actress of the year that this movie came out. So, the top movie of the year was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It was the top movie, so much so, that it did twice as much business as the second place. No, that's actually not true. It did four times as much business as the second place movie. When it came out, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the number one movie of all time, animated or live action. Can you believe that? It was only removed from that number one movie status by Gone with the Wind a few years later. So the number one movie of all time, box office champion, it'd be like today we look at movies like um, uh, Titanic or Avatar or something like that. This was the Avatar, Titanic, Star Wars of its day. It's a huge, huge movie. Um, it started in this parking lot of Gelson's. Now if you're from Los Angeles and drive down Hyperion Boulevard, this Gelson's is actually the site of Walt Disney Studio where Snow White was made. There's a little plaque in the parking lot you can actually see, and um, you can go stand in the parking lot where Walt Disney's office was and feel incredibly historic. Uh, this is what the studio looked like. So Gelson's is there today, but when Snow White was made, this is the high period studio it was made in. Um, and Walt's office was in the corner. This was a sound stage where a lot of the music was recorded. And um, these are the fine people of the Walt Disney Company back then. You can see they made Mickey Mouse cartoons, and Walt was really known for making cartoons. In fact, in 1935, he toured Europe with this Mickey Mouse doll, and he was this huge celebrity for Mickey Mouse. I mean, why not? Mickey Mouse is pretty cool. These are the handsome gentlemen of animation who were animating Mickey Mouse. Hold your applause later. Um, and these are the guys that animated Snow White eventually. But when they started out, they were really doing cartoons like this. This is an Oswald the Rabbit cartoon. If you're an Oswald fan, there's a great new book by Dave Bossert that's available outside of, about Oswald. He's an amazing character. And this is what they were doing. And 10 years later, they were doing this. How do you make that leap in 10 years, going from this really crude kind of cartoon to this kind of art deco masterpiece that you're about to see today? Well, Walt Disney saw that he didn't have everything he needed to do that, and he needed to put on a training program. So he brought in trainers and lecturers, and he studied things like these are Leland Stanford's race horses, and there's a guy named Edward Mybridge that filmed them and gave all this study footage to the Disney animators to study humans and animals in action. And the Disney animators studied this, and they started doing cartoons. The first one that was like Snow White, they were trying to figure out if they could do Snow White, was the Goddess of Spring. God forbid it looked like this. This is not so good. Um, but it's kind of a crude version of what Snow White would come to look at. So they studied some more. They did life drawing classes. They did action analysis. They talked about acting and drapery and all kinds of things. And they got better. They got a lot better. They brought in actresses to pose and model. They looked at inspiration from everywhere. This is um, Uta von Ballenstedt. She's a thousand year old 
personality that lived in Europe and was one of the uh, inspirations for the Wicked Queen in Snow White. She's a sculpture in Europe. And then they brought in Marge Belcher, who later became Marge Champion, the dancer. And Marge Champion was the model for, the, for Snow White. And she came into the studio and performed and danced so the animators could understand what the movement of Snow White would look like. And this is actual footage from the 1930s that the animators used to study Snow White's locomotion and her movement. It's very silly. So if you're an animator, this is gold. You can look at it, you can study not only how she moves, but how her dress moves, and um, make that into the movie, and, and turn that into inspiration for the movie. So this is Marge uh, dancing with the composer for the movie, Frank Churchill, who was quite a hoofer. <laughs> Yeah, so 80 years ago they were doing that, and eventually they came up with this cast of characters. Now, animation back then was done, this is remarkable, it was done with a pencil. Does everybody know what a pencil is? Yes! <laughs> Small wooden thing, with some lead in the middle. People actually drew the movie you're about to see today. And to show you that, I want to show you some pencil tests. These are a series of drawings shot in rapid succession that creates the illusion of life. Look at this. So they're pencil drawings, and the cool thing is if you look down in the corner, you'll see the drawing numbers go by. So this starts at drawing number one and goes up to drawing number 90. It takes about an hour to do a drawing. So you're looking at 90 drawings here. That's about 90 hours. About two weeks of work to do this. And it's beautiful. Here's another one which I love. Look at all the markups here. These are notes to the ink and paint people about the eyelashes. Take the eyelashes, um, make them very heavy, about three main lashes a piece. Uh, so the ink and paint ladies um, were doing amazing work on the makeup of the character. Uh, and there's a great book by Minnie Johnson about ink and paint right now. That's a little story about this. But look at this scene animate. Same thing, you can see the drawing numbers go by on the bottom. So I wanted to bring these along and show them to you because when this scene comes up in the movie, you'll go, oh my gosh, that was done with a pencil, and it really was. Um, here's another one. I can look at these all day. <laughs> to show perspective in animation, you have to draw it. So if she's running towards the camera, she has to run towards the camera, and she has to draw that perspective. And then those drawings are laid on top of a layout drawing. So the held drawing would be all the trees in the background and then the bats and her running towards the camera was just drawn with a pencil on a piece of paper. And again, you see the numbers go by down here. Here's another one. This is trying to throw Grumpy into the bathtub to give him a bath. What a mess this looks like. This is weeks and weeks and weeks of work. And my favorite one. So that's how those drawings got done. And then they would be traced onto a clear piece of plastic called a cell. And once again, the ink and paint staff worked to put makeup on the characters. So they had a little red wax pencil and they put the rouge on the cheeks of the Queen and on the cheeks of Snow White. So when you see the movie, you notice she has blush on her cheeks. It was all applied by hand, a little makeup on top of those characters. So that little red piece on her cheeks was a real special, unique thing that Disney did. You can see some of the ink and paint workers working on a cell here. The multiplane camera, which shot many, many levels, like this scene where you have foreground and water, and Snow White and the Huntsman in the background, was a real breakthrough for this movie. And in fact, on the movie posters, you see it in Technicolor. It's, and it says Multiplane Technicolor. Well, the movie opened at the Carthay Circle Theater, which you see behind me. And it was a big deal. Walt Disney was on the cover of Time Magazine when it opened. The articles inside were stunning. The reviews were great. And this is some photos from opening night, some of which are disturbing. <laughs> uh, Mickey, Minnie, and Donald costumes were not quite what they are today. <laughs> They built Snow White's entire village on the street in front of the theater. 
Here's the costumes for the dwarves arriving at the theater, and of course, the number one actress of the day, Shirley Temple, arriving with Walt Disney and his wife. Shirley Temple later gave an Academy Award to Walt Disney for this movie at the Oscars, and it was a, a large Oscar and a bunch of little tiny Oscars to celebrate Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And with the money from Snow White, Walt Disney built a brand new studio in Burbank, California that's still there. He moved there into a beautiful new creative campus, kind of the first of its kind. It had a gym, it had a uh, commissary, and all the money from Snow White went into building that campus and making these movies. So Snow White was such a success, he could bankroll that studio and all of these movies afterwards. So it was a huge, huge success. So that's the story of how Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs got to the screen, and I hope that gives you a little more appreciation for this masterpiece you're about to see. So sit back, get ready with the popcorn. Yeah, ready, and enjoy the 80th anniversary of this really special movie. Here it is, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Thanks, everybody.